It's the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting way too long. Welcome to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. My name is Steve Scrovan, along with my co-host, David Feldman. Hello, David. Good morning. And the man of the hour, Ralph Nader. Hello, Ralph. Hello, everybody. Martin Luther King Jr.'s elderly cousin was recently denied her right to vote. She was falsely accused of moving from the county she was registered to vote in. And this wasn't a mistake. She was just one over 198,000 voters purged from the voter rolls in Georgia by Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger. Our first guests are going to try to right these wrongs. Journalist Greg Palace, investigative fund, wrote a letter to the Secretary of State demanding he return these voters to the registration rolls before the election. What Georgia is doing is just one of the many examples of voter suppression happening this election season. Greg Palace is back to talk to us about voting rights and fill us in on what's happening right now. And we are less than two weeks away from the election, if you haven't heard. And there's been a lot of money spent on TV ads, $100 million of it on the Democratic Party side alone, trying to convince John Q. Public not to vote for the reality star who spouts QAnon conspiracy theories. Will it work? Is that money well spent? To help us answer those questions, we welcome back founder of Northwoods Advertising, Bill Hillsman. He's going to break down the late stage advertising strategies of both the Biden and Trump campaigns. In between, we will, as always, take some time to check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. But first, let's talk about what the Republican Party is doing to suppress the vote. David? Greg Palace is an economist and financial investigator turned journalist. He is known for his investigative reports for BBC, The Guardian, and Rolling Stone. Mr. Palace was instrumental in exposing historic controversies, such as the Shoreham Nuclear Power Station project, Exxon Valdez, the 2000 U.S. presidential election, and Deepwater Horizon. He is the author of The Best Democracy Money Can Buy, and his latest book is How Trump Stole 2020, the Hunt for America's Vanished Voters. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Greg Palast. It's always great to be with you again. Greg, let's try something different this time because okay. our steady listeners heard you on prior occasions outline yes. all the various horrors of blocking people from voting, blocking the accurate counting from voting, and so forth. What I want you to do is I'm going to give you the different categories of obstruction of voters. And then you tell me what's being done about it after you have a very brief definition of the obstruction. So let's start with purging voters. What is it quickly and what is being done on the ground to give people a sense of optimism? Well, as you know, there's a TV show called The Purge, where once a year you can kill anyone you want. We have a version of it in the U.S. in reality called The Purge, which is done by these partisan political officials called secretaries of state. Once a year, they can literally wipe off the voter rolls, those voters they think shouldn't vote. And not surprisingly, these hacks tend to remove people of color where they can, Republicans control the state. So, for example, in Georgia, as you just heard, the Secretary of State removed 198,000 voters illegally on false information, almost all of them black voters, young voters, including Martin Luther King's 92-year-old cousin. That report, which I did, my investigators, was put out by the ACLU. And I can't say it's – the one optimistic thing is that the word is getting out in Georgia – which is a swing state also with two Senate seats on the line, which could flip the Senate. The Secretary of State, a Republican hack, is not putting those 198,000 people back. We've threatened them legally, but it is motivating people to check their registrations, get out to the polls. But in other states, there's some good news. In Wisconsin, I did a report showing that nearly 100,000 people were facing a wrongful purge. There is an African-American lieutenant governor activist who brought me into the state, and the Board of Elections is refusing to remove these voters. It's a bipartisan Board of Elections. So, okay. you know, uh, there is integrity. Okay, let's, um, let's go a little deeper mm -hmm. here. People are purged if they pass away. People are sure. purged if they haven't voted in the last two elections. People are purged if they move their address. Now, how are people unpurging themselves with the help of citizen reform groups on the ground? 
Okay, so we've had a lot of groups from the ACLU, mainly Black Voters Matter, has been out there, and we've been pushing. And in fact, you know, actually probably the most effective thing we've had is that Leonardo DiCaprio hosted my PSA on look out if you're purged and check in, and five million people have seen that one-minute film. Go to Leonardo DiCaprio's well, Instagram. Tell us, and, tell us how they can unpurge yeah, themselves. So, so wait, so you unpurge yourself, first of all, in those states where you can still check your registration, and that includes, for example, Michigan, California, many, many states, the registration is still open, or you can even register on Election Day, including Wisconsin. So you can unpurge yourself simply by checking your registration, re-registering online if you can. Yesterday was the last day in Michigan for online, but you can, you can register in person. So people, if you know that you are purged, this is the hardest thing to do, check your registration at vote.org or go to gregpalace.com. We have links. And either re-register or in those states where you can, like Michigan and Wisconsin, swing states, go in and bring your ID, bring proof of address. Not easy. And by the way, Ralph, yes, most people don't understand. You miss a couple of federal elections, like a midterm and a general, and you could lose your vote. Not because you're allowed not to vote in America. You can vote and not vote. That's your choice as a citizen. What they're saying is if you didn't show up, it means you've moved. And that's one of the things we've been investigating and challenging. Not well, voting doesn't mean you've moved. Setting aside why there aren't criminal prosecutions of Secretary of State and other officials who are engaging really in the ultimate constitutional crime, yep. putting that aside, putting that aside that we don't have a national discussion on the Australian system where it becomes a universal legal duty to vote, and you can vote for right. none of the above or, or write in, take care of the civil liberties problems. But we have to go into the weeds here. One of the most malicious way of mm -hmm. removing somebody's vote is to say that their signature on an absentee ballot doesn't match the signature that was on something years ago. And I lost right. 5,000 petitional petition signatures that was assembled by a woman in Toledo, Ohio. Tremendous energy. And she went to file them, and they said, your signature, which she had to have on every sheet, mm -hmm. at age 52 doesn't match the signature you had when you registered first at age 21. Now, people have different signatures all the time. It isn't like well, a I, fingerprint. They just have different signatures or I their ready? hand moves in one way or another. And this is so malicious. How do you correct that? Who's going to correct that one? Okay, so let's get some numbers in here. In 2016, 141,000 mail-in ballots were thrown out because someone challenged a signature. Now, by the way, Ralph, we don't have 141,000 expert forgers in America. Not one single voter was arrested for this crime. Remember, the idea is to prevent someone from stealing your ballot, right. voting, and signing your name. Good point. There's no proof that anyone's done this, but yet all some schmuck in a boogaloo Hawaiian shirt has to do is say, I don't like that signature, and you've just lost your vote. And in okay. states like Texas, you're not even allowed to correct it. So how do you correct it? Number one – if you haven't asked for a mail-in ballot yet, don't. It's too easy to get challenged. Like I say, 141,000 just on signature. I know it's not easy. Go in early with your mask and your gloves and your sanitizer, maybe a couple lawyers with you, but try to avoid mailing in your ballot. And I'll tell you why. 100,000 people lost their vote for postage due in New York. The Democratic Party, sorry guys to tell you this, they challenged 24,000 ballots because – there was no postmark on those ballots because the post office does not automatically okay. postmark a pre stamp okay. ballot. Okay, what about change of residence? That's the way they block people. They go down the corridor and change their apartment number, and they say, oh, you changed your residence, you can't vote. Yes, that's what they were trying to do in, for example, in Wisconsin, if you moved at all. But federal law is pretty damn clear, Ralph. If you move within your, quote, jurisdiction, that, that means like in places like Georgia, they say it's the county or the city in Wisconsin. If you move within your building, and we literally spoke to people who moved within their building. One guy moved two doors down. They lost their vote, which is illegal. And you know why they do this, Ralph? Because who moves? Students move dorm room to dorm room, couch to couch. Low-income people, uh, renters move quite a bit, often within their building or down the street. So they know who they're removing. They're removing low-income voters, young voters, 
So let's talk mm-hmm. about students. There's a big yeah. article recently in the New York Times that the student vote is going to be diminished because of COVID-19, students studying by remote, not being in the locale. Can you give us a quick description of how serious that is and who is it going to disadvantage in what states? Well, I just spoke to student Pio Kwao of the University of Madison. For example, he moved two doors down, lost his vote. There are students who are sent away because of COVID. For example, 182,000 University of Wisconsin students, many of them out of state, have gone home, but their registration address, their voting address is in Madison, Wisconsin, or in Milwaukee. And they need a witness signature. They also need to mail in a copy of their ID, a photo state ID. And guess what? Scott Walker in the Republican legislature in Wisconsin said, if you use a student ID from the University of Wisconsin, it has to be a special one. Hardly anyone has it. So you send in the wrong ID photo, you can lose your vote there too. So it's, and it's really killed students because then they have to go in and get a special ID in an office that isn't even open. So they're playing these games. Texas, the same thing. You can't use the University of Texas ID, but you can you know, use your concealed carry gun permit ID to vote. Let's continue with this description of the slow motion coup d'etat. It always amazes me how people don't get really indignant on this. I mean, you know, throw them an ethnic slur or gender slur or racial slur, and they'll really climb up the wall and denounce it. But they don't really get angry. It's just beyond belief in American history. At this point, with the civil rights laws being enacted, all kinds of efforts against Jim Crow, women having the right to vote being part of the Constitution now. And these corporate lawyers for these Republican politicians, almost always Republican politicians, are just carving out the heart of our democracy, which is the sovereign right to vote. So tell us, who do you think the worst three states are in the country in terms of obstructing the right to vote? And how much of it is tilted, definitely, against people who would vote Democrat? I would say, without question, Georgia, Ohio, and Michigan And at this moment. Now, what's unusual about Michigan, I, you know, you expect it in Georgia. You've got this right-wing Republican conservatives, and they know and in a state which the census should show, of course, the census has been fixed too, by the way, Ralph, it's another discussion, but if the census is honest, Georgia is now a white minority state. It should be a solid blue state. The polls are showing the Democrats sweeping the presidential line and Senate, but yet they're massively removing voters. They are also, you know, they have a, what's called an exact match rule. So if you are voting, you have to have ID, which matches exactly. So, for example, if your name is Gabriel Garcia Marquez, you better have be registered. Remember that your ID, if it has accent marks or misses the hyphen or has the hyphen, you can lose your vote because it's not a, quote, exact match on your ID. And you're right, there's not enough indignation here. And who doesn't have IDs? And we have, by the way, similar ID law, for example, in Wisconsin that was left over from the Republican administration, where, you have again, you have to have a state photo ID. Well, who doesn't have a driver's license? People who don't drive, Ralph, people who don't have a car because they live in, in urban areas and apartment buildings. University of Wisconsin said, The ID law knocked out over 50,000 voters who really wanted to vote, who are African-American, who were blocked from voting in 16. That swung the state to Donald Trump. That's why Agent Orange is in the White House, because of these games. Another hurdle is ex-felons, people who paid their debt society. They come out, and in some states, they're still blocked from voting. Tell us the situation in Florida and what other states they blocked from voting. Well, here's the crazy thing. There's no state left in America which has that old Ku Klux Klan law, and it was written by the Ku Klux Klan, that ex-felons can never vote, that they lose their citizenship. We're not Saudi Arabia, Red China. You don't lose your citizenship for a crime anymore. However, they use all kinds of tricks. You can't be serving time or be literally incarcerated and vote if it's a felony crime in almost every state. The problem is, for example, in lots of states like Georgia and places like Colorado, they've been removing so-called ex-cons who aren't ex-cons. That's how George Bush became president. This is not something that Donald Trump invented. You mean ex-cons who are not ex-cons? 
That's right. One thing that we're not haven't been talking about in the fight over whether ex cons should vote is that most of these lists are dead wrong. And so, for example, in Florida in 2000, when I was with the, the Guardian and BBC, I, I got the list of these so-called ex cons. 58,000 of them, almost all of them black, not guessing because it says BLA next to their names on those voter registration forms for black. And um, I went through the list, and not one, not a single one, Ralph, was a illegal voter, not one. Yeah, they just had similar names, that's all. That's right. So, like, for example, Willie Steen, a Gulf War veteran, African-American, takes his five-year-old son with him to vote. To show them, how, you know, here's what Martin Luther King did for us. We got, you know, we won the vote. And they said, you can't vote. You're a felon. And his five-year-old and his son is saying, Daddy, what's a felon? And he's never gotten a parking ticket. His only crime was voting while black. Now, I looked him up. Willie Steen, the African-American in Florida, was removed because a guy named Willie Osteen, a white guy, was convicted in Ohio. But this happens all over the country. In fact, I, I caught the Republican Secretary of State of Colorado years ago when they and now it's a Democrat, but when they had a Republican, she removed fifty thousand so called ex con voters and there's no law in Colorado to block ex cons from voting. What you're saying, Greg, and you wanna mm-hmm. sum it up is mm-hmm. we got a situation now where in Republican dominated states politically, governor, mm-hmm. secretary of state, etc. The Democrats have to win by either fifty one percent, fifty two percent. Yeah, forget fifty one percent. You got to win by 56%, 55%. But the good news is that you can win if you get the 55, and they can't steal all the votes all the time. So that should motivate people. I have to say, that I had a disagreement. We spoke with Barack Obama when I was at the Rolling Stone, and he said he knew all about it. He had the down to the details of the vote suppression. He didn't say much about it. He said the way to deal with it is they steal. We said, you know, they steal, stole 5.8 million votes from me. He said, well, that's why I brought in 9 million more voters. So you can overwhelm the steal. Now, that's not comforting. Okay, that's well, not democracy. Right, but your, point, your point to God. Barack Obama and the Democrats, you think the Democrats are doing enough about this? They've been on notice for years. You've written about it for years. They've lost elections for years because of vote stealing and vote suppression. So here we are. Let's say it's two years before now. Have mm-hmm. they done what you think they should do? And if not, why not? Apart from okay. going after the Electoral College, which makes all this vote stealing so decisive. You think they've done what they should be doing? If not, what should they have been doing? Okay, two things. Let's be straight about it. There's two Democratic parties. There's white Democrats and and non-white Democrats. As I said, in Wisconsin, we had an African-American lieutenant governor, new Democrat, who pushed the state, brought me in, and and they stopped the purge. What about in swing state Michigan? You have the three white women who took over Democrats, who took over the government in Michigan, you'd say, well, that's going to reverse all the trickery that gave Trump the surprise Michigan win in 16. The GOP removed 313,000 voters on the most bogus basis. My experts have gone through the list, and they said, you've got 152,000 people illegally removed. And we posted the names of people said, please re-register. Do you know that I got a threat from the Democratic Attorney General saying, don't tell people about these purges. You're discouraging them from voting. And my response was, you know, if they're purged from the voter rolls, Madam Attorney General, they can't vote. No, the Democrats' position is that don't tell people that there's any problem with voting. Tell people like Joe Biden did during the debate, oh, all your mail-in votes will be counted. Don't worry. Well, you know, this don't worry, be happy position of the Democratic Party. Don't mention vote suppression. Don't mention the difficulty voting. Don't mention problems with mail-in ballots. Don't mention the purge. Well, ask President Hillary Clinton how this has worked out. It hasn't. Ask President Al Gore how this has worked out. And unfortunately, you know, they're throwing black votes, Asian American votes, young voters under the bus. Yeah, but you can understand their concern because it takes very little to discourage a lot of voters from voting you know because well, oh it's not going to count anyway i got to go meet my friend down the street and talk about the board of education problem or something you know you know what i got to tell you that ralph i was in georgia as you said when martin luther i was with martin luther king's 92 year old cousin when she was to my surprise never it well, wasn't to my surprise because i had her name on the list she was thrown out of the out of the polling station on her 50th year of voting at the same place 
Now, I got to tell you something. When I was in Georgia in 18, the fact that they were trying to steal the vote and Stacey Abrams, who's, of course, African-American, became the first Democratic candidate for governor that I've ever heard made the vote theft her number one issue. They're stealing our votes. They're stealing our votes. Rather than discourage people, they had a massive record turnout. I saw signs that says this precinct 100 percent voted in African-American areas. Instead of discouraging people, it got people whipped up, riled up. And by the way, I saw this in Mexico, too, with AMLO, who crushed the opposition in 18 by making count every ballot his number one campaign point. Okay, this is very encouraging if it's widespread. You think a lot of people are taking this, they're going to try to stop me from voting personally and redoubling their determination to go vote either in person or by ballot. You think that's a widespread situation in Wisconsin and Michigan, the so-called swing states? Yes, because I see, for example, Black Voters Matter especially has been probably the group at the forefront and Reverend Jackson with Rainbow Push. We've had some people right out on the front line saying they're stealing your vote that we bled for. Why aren't the Democrats headlining Jesse Jackson more? He's the greatest vote getter out in modern American history. I I don't read much about their effort to support him or enlist him. No, there isn't. Unfortunately, he's being, you know, look, I'm going to be very blunt. The Democratic Party really has a split with African-American activists who are saying we've got to make a point. Number one, start reversing these purges. You know, I've asked the Republican attorney general, not only asked, we made a legal demand on the Republican attorney general to return 198,000 votes identified by me and the ACLU as wrongly purged, mostly African-Americans, put them back on the rolls. Well, okay, I didn't expect a lot of joy from that guy because he'll lose his, his seat and the Republicans will get wiped off the map in Georgia. But what is shocking and frightening and unfortunate to me is that in Michigan, the Democratic attorney general is refusing to return to the voter rolls the people removed illegally, wrongly by her GOP predecessor. They don't want to deal with the issue of the purge. And maybe, you know, I, now I'm speculating, I admit, maybe there's just a fear of a black party. Remember that if every African-American is allowed to vote in Michigan, the black vote in Detroit will take over the Democratic Party and you will have a very different party. Yeah, people have said that to me. You're right. Let's ask another question. A ballpark Mm -hmm. estimate, Greg Mm Powell, assume X number of votes are being obstructed or have been obstructed. Mm -hmm. All the pushback by Black Votes Matter and all the citizen groups all over, how much are they going to recover of that? 20 percent, 30, 40, 50? I don't know. I'm a good investigative reporter, but I'm a bad speculator. But I am a statistician as well. And I could tell you that in 2016, 5.8 million ballots were cast and never counted. By the way, that's an official number from the EAC, from our federal agency. 5.8 million votes cast and not counted, like, for example, 925,000 provisional ballots thrown in the garbage. Now, how many can be recovered? I think a tremendous amount. I mean, I saw the the Abrams campaign. I saw Black Votes Matter, their operations. I have seen some activist groups out there. This time, it's I don't know what the percentage of recovery is, but it's going to be literally millions of votes have been saved. But I'm just very worried with this election because I've never seen the purge machine, and I'm very concerned about in such high gear. Plus, I'm extremely concerned about this massive mail-in vote and the ease with which we, in America, we allow people to challenge and disqualify mail-in ballots. According to MIT, 22 percent, one in five mail-in ballots, is never counted. Well, listen to this. Two things. One is, Mm -hmm. what likelihood will there be of recounts? Because if the election is that close, state law often says if it's within, you know, half of one percent, you've got to have a recount after the election. So give us your idea on that. And the second is, the kind of pushback that's going on, will it result in any criminal prosecutions in any state after the election? Two points, one, two. Okay, I'm going to go in reverse. Busting the bad guys, busting the ballot bandits, not a chance. Almost never happens. Because if you succeed, remember, wonderful thing about stealing an election, it's the perfect crime because you've stolen the police department, the voting police, right? The the Justice Department, if it's national and your attorneys general. So you take over basically the vote thieves 
Take well, what, what, if, the what, if the, what if the election puts a good secretary of state in charge, a new one, going after the crook who preceded them? I don't want to sound like a racist, but if it's a white secretary of state, don't, don't expect much, as we saw in Michigan. Well, is um, there a criminal penalty in any of these election laws to begin with? Yeah, there really are. I mean, you read the National Voter Registration Act, the Voting Rights Act, which is still there and still has its criminal positions. And, by the way, the Part B, Part 2 of the 14th Amendment of the Constitution says if you take away black people's votes or, you know, if you illegally remove voters, you're supposed to lose electoral votes and congressional seats. You know, it's never been enforced. Martin Luther King demanded the enforcement of that provision. And, you know, even uh, Lyndon Johnson wouldn't budge on that. Well, you know, without the Electoral College, we wouldn't be having this conversation. So why don't the Democrats constantly talk about getting rid of it or blocking it with the National Popular Vote? Dot org movement at the state level, which is already over half of the Electoral College votes, is on its way to succeeding. Why don't they talk about it? I mean, it's like they're fighting all these lethal skirmishes. They can decide whether they're going to win or lose in one swing state after another, and they don't keep this Electoral College monster, this iron collar around their throat before the public, build public opinion against it. Well, a couple decades ago, believe it or not, we came very close to eliminating the Electoral College. But now with the state so split red-blue, it's murder. And, of course, the Democrats are afraid of bringing up an issue that they are afraid will, quote, scare off white voters. You know, again, we're dealing with you, – you keep mentioning the Democrats. Look, don't expect the Democrats to save your vote, to fight for your vote. That's not what they do, okay? Martin Luther King was not part of the Democratic Party. Either were you. You brought up these issues. Well, if you were a Democrat party now, what would you do in the next 10 days to get more votes, either by issues or strategy or on the ground, transportation to the polls? What would you do quickly? Number one, I would notify everyone who's been purged from the voter rolls. You have 16, according to Brennan Center and the federal government, 16.7 million people have been yanked off the voter rolls, and very few of them know it. They're going to show up and be unable to vote. They should warn people where they can re-register to do so, and in states where you can re-register on the day, they should be preparing people. Because if you're going to wait five hours in line and told you have the wrong ID to vote, you're not registered, but you can't now re-register, that's going to be a big problem. We're talking hundreds of thousands of people that could be restored to the voter rolls if they're given the information and they are warned. And I tell everyone, vote early because you have a problem. You learn about it, so they should promote not mail-in voting, but voting early. And during the weekday, those places are empty. Well, one way to get get people to vote is millions of people are underpaid in this country, frozen minimum wage. You just say, go vote for a raise because we're going to give you 15 bucks an hour. The House well, yeah. has already passed it in Congress. Just go vote for a raise. Do you think the huge early turnout, which is now over 33 million votes, the huge early turnout augurs well for who? The Democrats or Republicans? Well, there's no question an early early voting, massive early voting, always helps the Democrats. The more people vote, the better it is for Democrats. But the thing is, is that people can vote or submit ballots. Remember, they're talking about the ballots submitted. They use the term counted. That just means that they got it and they marked it that as being received. But then there's tallied, meaning that they actually count the vote and add it to the Biden pile or the Trump pile. And we're going to lose 22 percent of those votes. Hell, the Democratic Party challenged every vote with scotch tape on it that was mailed in. That was hundreds of, of ballots. So the Democrat or Republican? No, that was the Democrats in New York. They flipped, in fact, a congressional seat by challenging 24,000 mail-in ballots. That's the Democrats. So you can imagine what the Boogaloo boys are going to do. Forget the Republican Party. Greg, Greg, you're going to spend years in the weeds here, winning a little, losing a little, going crazy, being irritated, upset. Take the lead for the Australian system. Universal voting as a duty, period. One, just just like jury duty. And if people don't like the candidates, they can vote right in whoever they want, or they can vote binding none of the above. You've got to get into that. Otherwise, you're just going to be hitting windmills here. You're going to be hitting it with with right-wing judges. We're out of time, Greg. Thank you very much. Give us your website again and the book that should be a bestseller but isn't. Well, it's a bestseller. It's just not on the list. It's called How Trump Stole 2020. 
don't worry, it's a, it's a warning, not a prediction. How Trump Stole 2020. And by the way, if you go to gregpalace.com, it is, as of today, available as a free audio book download at gregpalace.com, G-R-E-G-P-A-L-A-S-T dot com. And stay tuned for the next two weeks where we give you reports on how to save your vote and who's stealing it. But let's hope history doesn't write that the COVID-19 Trump's virus and his bungling and spreading of it because he didn't act soon enough and he has never acted scientifically enough doesn't come back to help him and the Republicans by keeping hundreds of thousands of students from voting and many others because of the COVID-19 pandemic. Absolutely. This is a big problem because, for example, that's one of the reasons we have long lives. We don't have the poll workers. By the way, if you're young enough and healthy enough, please sign up to be a poll worker. That's very important, young people. Sign up to be a poll worker because a lot of the elderly volunteers are too frightened to go to the polls because they're excessively vulnerable to the COVID-19. Stand up for the elderly people who volunteered for decades and take their place. Thank you very much, Greg. You're the best. Let's stay in touch on this. We've been speaking with journalist Greg Pallast, author of How Trump Stole 2020, The Hunt for America's Vanished Voters. We will link to his book at ralphnaderradiohour.com. Now let's take a short break. When we return, Bill Hillsman of Northwoods Advertising is going to help us analyze the strategies behind the ad buys of both the Biden and Trump campaigns. But first, let's check in with our corporate crime reporter, Russell Mokhyber. From the National Press Building in Washington, D.C., this is your Corporate Crime Reporter Morning Minute for Thursday, October 15, 2020. I'm Russell Mokhyber. Captain Chesley Sully Sullenberger isn't satisfied that the fixes for Boeing 737 MAX proposed by the Federal Aviation Administration are enough. In an interview with the Seattle Times, the pilot said that even if the FAA ungrounds the jet next month as expected, Additional modifications are needed as soon as possible to improve the plane's crew alerting system and add a third check on the jet's angle of attack data. I'm not going to say we're done, good enough, move on, Sullenberger said. People are going to fly on it, and I will probably be one of them, he said. The updated MAX will probably be as safe as the previous model 737NG when they are done with it, but it's not as good as it should be. For the Corporate Crime Reporter, I'm Russell Mokhyber. Thank you, Russell. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour. I'm Steve Scrovan, along with David Feldman and Ralph. Joe Biden's campaign is advertising heavily on shows like Wheel of Fortune and Jeopardy. These shows are popular among older people, and Biden's campaign is trying to appeal to older voters. Sure enough, it seems to be working in red-leaning states, where there has been movement from white people over 55. Our next guest will tell us more about the political advertising strategies of both campaigns. David? Bill Hillsman is a writer and an expert on independent voters. He is the founder and CEO of Northwoods Advertising in Minneapolis, Minnesota. He ran award-winning political advertising campaigns for Senator Paul Wellstone, Governor Jesse Ventura, and our very own Ralph Nader's presidential campaign. Northwoods Advertising has won numerous awards for creativity in advertising, including an Emmy and multiple Polly Awards. Mr. Hillsman authored the book, Run the Other Way, Fixing the Two-Party System, One Campaign at a Time. Welcome back to the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, Bill Hillsman. Hey, everybody. Yeah, welcome, Bill. You know, the Democrats are pouring in records amount of money in national and local state targeted television ads. I often wonder if some of that money was used to transport voters who have trouble getting to the polls or other get out to vote in neighborhoods would register more results for them. But anyway, I have questions like a lot of other people about how effective these ads are, not only technically, but whether they're headlining raising the minimum wage to a livable wage or dealing with the sexual predation record of Trump against women or just addressing in specific ways people's widespread anxiety, dread, and fear, which transcends red and blue states. So we've collected some of these ads, and Steve Scrovan is going to be sort of the MC and describe them and have you comment on them and Make any proposals you might make as to what would be new, very effective radio and TV ads. 
All right, very good. The first one we're going to play for you, and I understand, you know, we're on radio here, so you're not going to see the images. So this first one we're going to play is titled Flex Your Power, and the speaker you're going to hear is Ryan Chazier, who's a former linebacker for the Pittsburgh Steelers. And it seems to echo what we were just speaking with Greg Palast. It's all about voting. So here you go. I'm Ryan Chazier. In 2016, I didn't vote. I didn't think it mattered. I won't make that mistake again. One thing I learned in life, you have to make the most of every opportunity you get. Right now, you have the opportunity to make positive change in your community by voting. When you vote, you use your voice and you flex your power to make change. Want change? Go vote. Use your power. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. All right, Bill, what do you think of that? I think it's a pretty good ad. I mean, in a macro sense, the Biden campaign has so much money right now, they can afford to do a really good job in all of the swing states, which is where presidential campaigns normally concentrate all their dollars, and they can start advertising on a national basis. National TV ads, especially on sports programming and event programming, are really cost-efficient buys for presidential campaigns because everybody in the nation has a vote. But mostly in recent years, presidential campaigns have been limited to a small number of swing states because of the Electoral College vote. And Biden's in a very unique position where he can now afford to compete very well in swing states. He can compete very well on a national basis, and he can expand the map to go into some traditionally Republican states and make Trump spend resources there. And in all of these ads, they are surrogates speaking for him, which the three that we're going to show you, it's never Joe Biden speaking for himself, except at the end where he proves the message. Also, in this particular ad, it's very much pointed at Pennsylvania. It's a former linebacker for the Pittsburgh Steelers. He got a bad break in his career. He had a horrendous injury on the field. And he's sending the message to sports fans, to young people, that you have to take advantage of the moment, that you have to do things in the moment because you don't know what the future is going to hold. So that's an extremely effective ad for Pennsylvania. And I think it's also an extremely effective ad for traditional groups that that you would think would be more in Trump's camp, white males, sports fans, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that's a good segue into this next ad, which is from a U.S. Army veteran. And this one is called Worth Fighting For. I served for five years. When I first got back, I'm looking for snipers. I'm looking for IEDs. That PTSD was compounded by the fact that I was sick. Essentially, the muscles are evaporating off my body. My friends, they are not suckers. I didn't join the United States Army for me. I joined because I love this nation. I believe Joe Biden knows what makes this country worth fighting for. He would do everything he possibly can do for our country and for their families. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. So how about that one, Bill? That soldier's also from Pennsylvania. So again, it's a very effective ad in Pennsylvania. But once more, Biden's campaign has started to adopt the tactics that Republicans have used for so long. Republicans realized a long time ago that you don't necessarily attack your opponent on their weaknesses. You attack them on their strengths. And what we're starting to see with Biden's campaign is he's doing that to Trump. So what he's now doing is he's competing for voters that the Trump campaign were basically taking for granted. Trump was making the very patriotic pitch. He's the commander in chief. He figures that military families and people that are interested in the military are automatically going to vote for him. But this is a very patriotic commercial, and it's aimed at those particular voters. And it really takes Trump to task for calling people who have fought and died for our country suckers. But it doesn't say so. It doesn't say so directly. You're correct. But he does reference it in what the soldier says. He says that he and his friends are not suckers. And so for, you're right, it's not as direct as it probably should be. But for the people who understand this and who understand what Trump has said about enlisted military, the message comes across. And in in this next one, another surrogate, and 
obviously none of these are issue oriented. It's all kind of character oriented and people being from these different walks of life endorsing Joe Biden. This next one is actually a college student and a football player. His name is Tristan Vance. My name is Tristan Vance. I'm a college student as well as a football player here in Arizona. I've been working my whole life towards a dream to play professionally. Missing this season puts those dreams in jeopardy. Trump's failure of leadership is why we can't play right now. I don't blame President Trump for the virus, but I 100% blame him for the response to the virus. We need a leader who's going to look out for all of us, to be constructive and build. I trust Joe Biden to do that. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. So that was from Arizona. Right. That's a college student from Arizona who's basically saying to sports fans across the country, particularly college football fans, that, you know, we are having trouble being able to play, being able to make a living after college because of the way Trump has handled the coronavirus. I think it was a relief pitcher for one of the Major League Baseball teams that said sports is actually like the dessert that we get. It's the reward that we get for having a functional society. And and there's a lot of truth to that. You know, if we had responded to this coronavirus pandemic differently, who's to say how much easier it would have been for players to get back on the field, for this to be under control, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's an effective ad. It's an effective ad in Arizona. It's an effective ad of the groups that it's trying to talk to and take Trump to task on his handling of the coronavirus. Aren't you bothered? But so far, there doesn't seem to be any specific issues like living wage or the various no, economic it, security things that are on people's minds. No, you're right about that, Ralph. But these are very, very surgical types of ads that they're running right now. They're really going into certain areas of the country and they're going after certain voter groups that should be strengths for Trump. So the ads themselves you know, they're not tremendous. They're not going to make everybody talk about it to all their friends and family. Bill, it's the same approach that they lost on in prior elections. They're trying to spin off a few voters from right of center, and they're not trying to get out the huge number of non-voters that are left of center. If you're saying they're taking for granted the voters that they believe they already have in their camp, I think that's true. They are taking those voters for granted. They've decided to expand the field. They've decided to attack Trump on some of his strengths. Whether that's going to work or not, I don't know. From an advertising perspective, though, it seems to make some sense, based primarily upon just how much money he has. He's in a really unique position. All right. Well, this next ad, we're going to now turn to the Trump approach. And I have to explain a little bit of the visual on this one. This one is just a visual of a big pink piggy bank. And the sound you're going to hear is that piggy bank cracking open from an anvil with a picture of Joe Biden's face on it. So with that in mind, we're going to play this ad, which is entitled Joe Biden Wants Your Money. President Trump's tax cuts help families save $2,000 a year. But in comes Joe Biden's tax plan. Four out of five Americans will have their taxes raised. Not cool. Don't vote for Biden. Your taxes will go up. Well, I don't quite know what to say. It's maybe the worst presidential campaign ad I've seen in 20 years. It's so amateurish and poorly done. There are high school students. There are middle school students that could do a better commercial than this one There's no energy for the ad whatsoever. The voiceover is maybe the worst voiceover I've ever heard in a political ad. And I really, when it was sent to me to preview, I, I really thought this can't be a real ad from the Trump campaign. It doesn't have the disclaimer on it. I don't know how it ever got on the air. It is just that bad. But apparently it's a real ad because didn't you guys say it was on his website? Why do you think specifically it's a bad ad? Other than the voiceover. Well, but that's a big part of it. I mean, there's no energy to the ad. There's nothing in that ad that would get anybody to pay attention to it visually or from an audio standpoint. 
How about the um, two thousand dollar estimate, which is not accurate for millions of people, but how about that? Well, again, I think if two thousand dollars is a lot of money to you, and it is a lot of money to most Americans, maybe that gets your attention. I don't think so. I mean, there are local TV ads that are way better that are made by the studios. <laughs> That by the TV stations that are way better than this particular ad. I mean, it's it's just embarrassing how much it fails on the very basic duties of an ad. But even that basic message of he's going to cost you money, that simple message, there, you don't think that's effective? It's not going to come through. It's just such a poorly done ad that that message is not going to come through. People who watch TV, Americans who have been watching TV, We've been watching TV since the 1950s. We're all experts on commercial production values. And an ad like this just, just has no place in a, in a presidential campaign. It is that poor. Wow. It is that bad. Wow. All right. Well, so this next one is uh, kind of interesting. The title of this one is called Biden Lied. This argument will be very familiar to anybody who's listened to Trump in the last four years. A Ukrainian company hands Hunter Biden a lucrative deal. If your last name wasn't Biden, do you think he would have been asked to be on the board of Burisma? Probably not. Joe Biden said he knew nothing. Turns out he lied. Biden met personally with a Ukrainian executive after they'd hired his son. Joe Biden lied to the American people about his family making themselves rich off of the vice presidency. What else is he lying about? I'm Donald J. Trump, and I approve this message. Well, he approved that one. What do you think, yeah. Bill? Do you approve? You know, it's it's an ad that's got a lot of things taken out of context. It's produced a lot better than the last ad, but as we said, almost anybody could produce a better ad than the last ad. The problem with it is strategic. I mean, I understand this notion of taking a vulnerability of your own and then trying to pin that on your opponent. But if strategically... For Trump to try to make, and I understand what he's doing, he's trying to come up with an 11th hour scandal that somehow tars the opponent in the same way emails tarred Hillary Clinton down the stretch in 2016. I understand what he's trying to do, but it makes no sense for you to be criticizing the son of your opponent for trying to make money when your family is notorious for profiting off your own presidency. I mean, I just don't understand who he's he's really trying to convince of this, because if it's the voters who are already in his camp, he's already got those voters. So I don't really see how this commercial gets him any new voters. And that's the position that he's in right now. If he continues to talk to his base, well, that's not enough to get him reelected. Well, but if Greg Palast is right and all that voter suppression comes out, I think that's what they're probably gambling on, is just fire up the base, get as many of the base out there, and hope that they can purge enough Democratic voters to find a path to the Electoral College. Yeah, there's a couple of things the Trump campaign has maintained that if they're true, Biden is in danger of losing this election. And one of the things they keep saying is that they've got a better ground game than the Democrats. Well, that should be head spinning because that's traditionally been a Democratic strength. In all the time that I've been doing politics, Democrats have had a far better ground game than Republicans do. So if for whatever reason, the Biden campaign and the Democrats don't have as robust a ground game as the Republicans do this time, that's a real danger, especially when you work in considerations about voter suppression. That's what did in Hillary Clinton in 2016. She didn't have a ground game. She had plenty of money, but she didn't have a ground game. Spent it on national television telling people how unfit Donald Trump would be as president. Well, that should be a real concern for Democrats then, because that is a way that you can lose the election, especially in upper Midwest swing states and Rust Belt swing states. The other thing that Republicans maintain, and I think this is true, is that they're basically kicking the Democrats' ass in digital communications. And digital communications is important. It's, it's especially in an age of coronavirus, it's the way that 
people interact with each other socially these days. There's no better communication persuasion method than word of mouth from a friend or somebody you trust. How could that be, Bill? The Democrats had an early start. They really dominated social right. media. How could, what happened? I really don't know. I think some of it was the expertise that Facebook brought to the Trump campaign in 2016. But the, the Republicans claim, and I think it's true, that they really are in much better shape in social media and digitally in those types of communications than the Democrats are. And you're right. It's something that the Democrats should dominate in the same way they should dominate the ground game. We know there's more of us than there are of them. We know that from the popular vote. But to be failing on social media and in digital when there's more of you than there are of them, that's a real problem. All right, let's do one last one here. This is also from the Trump campaign, and it is entitled Insult. I'm Donald J. Trump, and I approve this message. Joe Biden insulted millions of black Americans. If you have a problem figuring out whether you're for me or Trump, then you ain't black. Worse, Biden wrote the mass incarceration laws that destroyed a generation of black families. We have no choice but to take them out of society. Away from my mother, your husband, our family. Lock the SOBs up. He insulted us, jailed us. We must not elect him president. So that was obviously targeted at a certain audience. Yeah, again, I think if Trump is going to win, it's going to be a very, very close election. I think we all understand that. So what they're doing here, again, is trying to win on the margins. Again, I think this commercial has a lot of factual inaccuracies in it. It's a lot of out-of-context statements. And it's a, it's a naked play to black voters to say, well, Joe Biden is not on your side. But the problem is, is it's a choice. It's between Joe Biden and Donald Trump. And I, I don't know how Trump convinces, well, I, I actually don't know how Trump convinces himself how he thinks he's better for black voters than Biden is. But convincing black voters of that is an even tougher job. So strategically, I don't really understand this either. He needs to Every incumbent president who stands for election, it's a evaluation of your job performance. And he, he should be talking about whatever accomplishments he can, he can piece together from his four years in office. And he should be telling Americans about a vision for the future as opposed to running these types of commercials, I think, if he's going to ever expand his base. But they seem to be running a campaign that they intend to win as a war of attrition, that they're going to knock down the number of people that can vote, the number of black citizens that can vote, the number of particular types of groups. They're going to cut into the margins there and somehow become victorious on Election Day. I don't know if it's going to work. If they've got a strong enough ground game and digital program, maybe it is. So, Bill, let's sum this up. What do you see happening in terms of these late stage strategies less than two weeks before the election? I think we're in a very similar position to 2016, and that should worry a lot of people. But the good news is that I do think Biden is ahead. I think he's ahead in most of the key swing states. I think they're doing a passable to good job in terms of mass communications, like advertising. They ran an extremely good ad. Biden ran an extremely good ad on the first game of the World Series last night. They were somehow able to get Sam Elliott to be the voiceover on that. And it's gotten a remarkable response. The nature of the ad was a call to bring us together. And there is no more American, especially Western American voice than Sam Elliott. I mean, that ad alone is going to get, the fact that Sam Elliott was the voiceover in that ad is going to get them tens of thousands of votes just just on that basis. You know what? I have that ad. Let's play that ad for our audience. There is only one America. No democratic rivers. No Republican mountains. Just this great land and all that's possible on it with a fresh start. Cures we can find. Futures we can shape. Work to reward. 
dignity to protect. There is so much we can do if we choose to take on problems and not each other, and choose a president who brings out our best. Joe Biden doesn't need everyone in this country to always agree. Just to agree, we all love this country and go from there. I'm Joe Biden, and I approve this message. Of course, what you miss with that are the visuals. And I will be the first person to say that the music was a little cheesy and they could have done a much, much, much better job in terms of the soundtrack. But Sam Elliott's voice and the language of that ad copy, along with the stirring visuals that were a big part of the commercial, makes a pretty good summation of Biden's argument that he can bring us together. And I think that's an effective appeal, especially coming down to the end of the election for most American voters. Thank you very much. We've been talking with Bill Hillsman from Minnesota. He has known how to win for underdogs such as Jesse Ventura and Paul Wellstone, but he's not seeing his phones ringing by the Democrats <laughs> for ideas which has really bothered me, Bill, because it seems like there's only one or two or three heads that are making the decisions here instead of a wide array of input. Nobody is smarter than everybody. Well, thank you for that compliment, Ralph. I mean, we're rested and we're ready. Very good. Thank you, Bill Helsman. You're welcome, Ralph, anytime. Stay healthy. You too. Well, that's our show. I want to thank our guests again, Greg Pallas and Bill Hillsman. For those of you listening on the radio, we're going to wrap this up. For you podcast listeners, stay tuned for some bonus material we do call the wrap-up. A transcript of this show will appear on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour website soon after the episode is posted. Subscribe to us on our Ralph Nader Radio Hour YouTube channel. And for Ralph's weekly column, it's free. Go to nader.org. For more from Russell Mokhyber, go to corporatecrimereporter.com. For a copy of The Day the Rats Vetoed Congress, go to ratsreformcongress.org. And also check out Wrecking America, How Trump's Law-Breaking Allies Betray All, co-written with Mark Green. We will link to both of those. The producers of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour are Jimmy Lee Wirt and Matthew Marin. Our executive producer is Alan Minsky. Our theme music, Stand Up, Rise Up, was written and performed by Kemp Harris. Our proofreader is Elizabeth Solomon. Our intern is Michaela Squire. Join us next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour when we welcome Morris Pearl of Patriotic Millionaires. Thank you, Ralph. And this is a great program coming up. A bunch of millionaires being very progressive in terms of military, foreign, and domestic policy and having an effect. Thank you, everybody. Hi, this is Jimmy Leewert, producer of the Ralph Nader Radio Hour, and welcome to the wrap-up. First, David and Steve question Greg Pallast. Before we get out of time, I want Steve and David to weigh in here with some uh, rational indignation inquiries. Is there any help we could get from the U.N. or a judgment from the U.N. on this? No, the Carter Centers and the U.N. have said that the U.S., believe it or not, does not meet the minimum standard of democracy, which you have to have before they will send in observers. I can't make that up. That's right. Jimmy Carter said that. Yeah. He said the U.S. is no longer a democracy. And therefore, they can't send in observers because you have to have a minimum standard that they can apply. So, I mean, this is... This is how sick our system has become. My Swiss wife, where, again, everyone votes, no registration, and they've got a bigger foreign population than America by proportion. They're not afraid of millions of illegal voters. Everyone votes, no problem. You don't run in and show IDs. You you vote. And, you know, we have this broken, Jim Crow-tainted democracy. Yes, it's not you can't vote if you're black, simple stuff. But it, we've gone from, you know, white sheets to spreadsheets to knock out voters of color. And young people are the new big, big target. You know, if we don't change the system, and, you know, again, don't wait for the Democrats to do this for you, my friends. The Democrats aren't going to save your vote. You save your own vote. Well, but, you know, yeah, I don't see how some of these people like Senator Peters from Michigan are going to survive without the student vote. Or Governor yes. Bullock is going to beat the sitting senator in Montana without the student vote. I mean, that, that's really the wild card now because of the COVID and remote student learning where they can't vote. Yes, so a student temporarily moves back home because of COVID. They have him down on a change of address, and they say, oh, you don't live here anymore, and they lose their vote. 
because you're sheltering at home doesn't mean that you're yeah. still a legal voter. I but mean, Michigan is, State is a, is a big factor in who goes to Congress. All the students and faculty in Michigan State yeah. and Lansing. That's right. So we have the so again, you have a Democratic Party in Wisconsin which is fighting to save the vote. You have a Democratic Party in Michigan which says, "Shh, you know, don't say anything about the difficulty of voting. Don't say voters have been purged." Well, it doesn't matter whether they're discouraged. If they're purged, if they've been canceled from the voter rolls, Ralph, they they can't vote. And so, you know, I mean, I don't know what to do. Democrats have taken this vow, this omerta vow on basically racial bias in our voting and the attack on the voter rolls. Again, with this idea that it discourages voters to tell them that there's problems. Well, you got to tell people, look, voting is not as easy as pick and lick, you know, pick a candidate, lick a stamp, send it in. You better tell people how to vote so they don't lose it. You better tell people that they better check their registration. You better tell people to bring their IDs and their proof of address and if you don't, you're going to lose millions of votes. You're going to lose more states, and I agree. Give people your website where they can be guided as to what to do. Okay, go to gregpalast.com. That's G-R-E-G-P-A-L-A-S-T dot com. Yeah, Steve? Yeah, Greg, we had Larry Cohn of Our Revolution on the show last yeah. week, and he was in Germany, and he said they didn't even understand the concept of registering. They didn't know what that meant. Yeah. Why do we even have to register to vote? Why is that necessary? Is it necessary? Well, registration was created in Philadelphia at the beginning of the 19th century to prevent blacks coming up from the South voting and to prevent Jews and Italian immigrants in Philadelphia from voting. You only had to register, according to state law, in Pennsylvania if you're in Philadelphia. So this is where it began. It began as one of the original ways to stop black people, Jews, and Southern Europeans from voting. That's how it started. And so it's really, you know, what about people would tell you, well, you need to register so with, that we know who you are and that you're a real legal citizen and all of that. So that's, that's really not necessary? Well, South Dakota doesn't have registration. And believe it or not, we don't have a passel of, of Canadians or, or mooses coming in to vote or people crossing from one Dakota to the other to sneak in a second vote. It doesn't happen. It's ridiculous. All these voting laws to stop fraud, which is a voter fraud, which is a crime that doesn't exist. The Supreme Court just said, for example, that South Carolina could still require a witness signature on your ballot, as does Wisconsin, two witness signatures in Alabama, which the Supreme Court approved, two witnesses to stop voter fraud. Well, most states don't have any witnesses. Why should the court say two witness signatures in the middle of a virus, and they know who's getting knocked out by this? It's the African-American voters. It's the poor voters. In other words, the blue voters. So they understand why we have all these laws. They're not neutral. They're not to stop fraud. We, it's a con. We know it. But don't expect the Democratic Party to call it out. We have to take care of our vote, and the voting rights movement is far from over. But don't well, expect the political party to save you. That's why Mitch McConnell's blocking the election security bill that the House passed a long time ago. Because they know what they're doing. The trouble is, do enough Americans know what they're doing so they can mount a major reform movement and sweep aside all this junk, all this anti-constitutional, anti-civil rights, anti-civil liberties obstruction that make a mockery worldwide of our so-called republic? And now we continue our conversation with Bill Hilsman. I don't know if you saw this, but in early September, a study came out from a couple of Yale political scientists And the conclusion was that political ads have little persuasive power. And I just want to read a quote and get your reaction to it. This is from the study. There's an idea that a really good ad or one delivered in just the right context to a targeted audience can influence voters. But we found that political ads have consistently small persuasive effects across a range of characteristics. Positive ads work no better than negative ads. Republicans, Democrats, and independents respond to ads similarly. Ads aired in battleground states aren't substantially more effective than those broadcast in non-swing states, unquote. What, what is your reaction to that as an ad man? Well, my reaction to that is that political scientists have been doing this for decades. They don't really have a lot of other things to do. So eventually they always go out and they try to do research studies that try to replicate whether advertising has an effect on people or not. And it's, I, I think it's frankly crazy to think that it doesn't. If it didn't, 
Pepsi and Coke wouldn't be out there advertising all the time. Car manufacturers wouldn't be out there advertising all the time. There's an industrial complex at work here, same way we make weapons that we know. Where people are convinced we need weapons, so they make weapons, and I think politicians are convinced they need ads. They do need ads because it's a choice. Anytime you have a choice, which we are fortunate to have in this country, whether it's toothpaste or candidates, anytime you have a choice, you need advertising, you need messaging, you need some type of communications to inform voters or consumers about those choices. But only for defensive purposes. Yeah. I mean, I would love to have the brand in the category that advertised where none of the other brands thought it was worthwhile to do advertising. <laughs> I'd have 80% market share. Is it possible it's, a, it's almost like a money laundering operation where the consultant class insists on raising money and that money has to go somewhere so they convince the politicians to spend it on TV advertising? Where they get a 15% commission. Yeah. 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 You know, there's other political science studies that prove that whoever spends the most money on advertising wins. There's lots of those. <laughs> so, Do you think it's possible that Trump is hoarding his campaign treasury because he's going to need it after he loses? Because if his ads are this bad and he's dark in all these swing states, do you think... You mean his personal money or his campaign money? Well, can't he keep some of his war chest and use it for legal fees when he's yeah. being sued? Yeah, he probably can. Yeah, he probably can. But I don't know that... I don't know that he'd be doing that right now, because if he was, if you look at the way their ad buying strategy has gone in recent weeks, what they did was they pulled out of swing states, including Pennsylvania and the upper Midwest, for about 10 days, maybe as much as two weeks, not quite two weeks. And the main reason they had to do that was they had to compete. They had to continue to spend money in places like Florida in Arizona, where they, they weren't expecting to have as much pushback from Biden. And now they're back into the markets, which I don't think they would be doing, at least not to this degree, if what you were suggesting was the real intent here. You never want to not be on the air the last 10 days of the election, the last two weeks to 10 days. That's just a recipe for suicide. So they had to figure out some way to, to save enough money to be on the air the last 10 days to two weeks where they needed to be on the air. Right. So but he was, is burning through cash. I mean, they yeah. can't help themselves. They see this money. You just know that they're thinking, this is ours. Why should we be giving this to television stations? This is our money. Well, I, I would argue that in his mind, at least, the most important thing, the only thing that probably saves them is getting reelected. Right. So I don't think he would hold back on anything that would hurt the chances of his, his reelection, because that's the only thing that saves him. But why are you allowed to lie in ads? I mean, I, I know on social media now, they're starting to police that a little bit, but two of these Trump ads in particular, you said had a lot of factual inaccuracies. There's no penalty for that in political advertising? Well, Ralph probably knows about this better than anybody in the country. But no, there's not. You can't censor federal candidates for office in terms of the content of their ads. The only check is the television stations. They could refuse to put on an ad that's racist or crass. They can do that. They've done it. But the FCC is not going to do anything about this. They're too slow and too indentured. So they just have to make a statement that is close enough to the truth or some fragment of it you could argue and get away with it, like the $2,000 you know, from the tax cuts or any other factual inaccuracy. Yeah, there's a wide range of inaccuracy permitted. The only time the FCC would move is if it was something grossly obscene, like they moved against Howard Stern, which is why he stopped doing over-the-air radio and went to Sirius XM. Right. This only applies to stations that are federally licensed. Right. This may be a minor point, Bill, but let's talk about the music. I, I've often wondered why they use music to begin with and why it gets to be so loud, even on Marketplace, on NPR, when they're doing the numbers for the stock market, which, you know, is pretty interesting to listeners. 
they have music that moves from the background to the foreground. What is this constant music? Why is that necessary? <laughs> well, it's proven to be the most effective form of communications aside from being there in real life is something that approximates real life and having sound and motion and visuals at the same time all together can be emotionally pretty stirring. Now, if you add the right kind of music to that mix, it pluses it even more. But you're right. The problem these days with the technical problem these days with mixing sound and voice together is you don't know exactly how it's going to come out on the other end, on the playback, because everybody's got all sorts of gizmos that they watch these things on now. Yeah, that's right. When I can tell you, Ralph, from movies and television perspective that, you know, I can watch something I'm working on without music and it can just be flat. It can be great dialogue, it can be a great scene, but the music, once you add the music, it, it's an emotional cue. In thrillers, you can up the suspense and the anticipation by certain types of music. And so it really is, I mean, music is really the soundtrack of our lives and it evokes memories and it evokes all of these things that you wouldn't know where they came from. It can make you cry even without any explanation. So that's, that's true, Steve, but it, you can have too much of a good thing. For example, they have these highly poignant stories on NPR where people are narrating what they went through in the COVID-19 wards in the hospital. And we're talking radio now. And the music is so loud that it interferes with the narration of the person. Right. Well, it has to be used judiciously and professionally and, and, and expertly, but yeah. And very often it's the wrong music. Like on Kyle Rizzo's Marketplace on NPR, you know, when I envision Kyle Rizzo, I envision him as a drummer. I mean, he's like, the music is jive music. It's, it's totally contradictory to the seriousness of what's being transmitted. Of course, you can never tell the music director anything anyway. They don't hear. Right. But I can't hear that in my head right now from Kai Rizdal, but I would suspect that that's purposeful, that it is a counterpoint to the seriousness. So that if he's talking seriously about these things, and then you also have heavy music, then it could be something that weighs you down. Does, does that make any sense to you, Bill? Yeah, it does. I, I mean, Ralph, Ralph has a really good point, And some of it is deadline driven. Some of it is time driven. And when you don't have very much time, you often pick the wrong music. And you would be better off, quite frankly, without any music, as opposed to putting bad music in there. But it seems to be something that's taken hold, and, and most stations like to have the music behind certain content. They just don't always make the greatest choices. On the other hand, you can have weeks and months to do it, too, and you can still pick the wrong music. I see that a lot in TV commercials. Bill, you live in the upper Midwest. The upper Midwest is crucial to the selection. What do you see in Wisconsin, Minnesota, Michigan, and Ohio? I think it's going to be close. I think it's become less close in Minnesota recently, which is not to say, remember, Clinton only won by about 40,000 votes here last time. And there's nothing to say that the race would not tighten almost to that point again up here. Wisconsin is going through a terrible coronavirus outbreak right now. I think that works definitely to the president's disadvantage. And consequently, I believe Biden has opened up a pretty good lead there, but again, not outside the margin of error. Michigan and Pennsylvania, I think, are going to be very, very close. I, I think we, those cannot be taken for granted by anybody. In terms of some of our analysis, Pennsylvania may be the state where Trump is concentrating the most because there's a lot of electoral votes at stake there. And if he is even close, we would expect to see him file some type of a protest and look for some type of recount and do anything that would deliver him Pennsylvania and thereby the election. Ohio is almost deadlocked now. And people say that if former Republican Governor John Kasich, who is was on the Democratic National Convention going after Trump would campaign a little, it would tip the scales in Ohio. And if the Democrats win Ohio, they win the election. That's true. If the Democrats win Ohio or Florida, it really doesn't matter. Nothing else really matters. There's no path for Trump. 
But right now, I think a key thing that the Democrats need to be considering so they don't get caught flat footed is they may need communications and they may need messaging the day after Election Day. If this is close, I'm quite certain the Trump campaign is ready to be out there blasting on the airwaves all sorts of misinformation, disinformation, anything that can support their case that this was an extraordinary election that was rigged in some way against him, and they'll be filing legal challenges. And we know that public opinion has a lot to do with the way that the courts rule. So particularly in states that might have a Republican governor, a Republican legislature, a Republican-leaning state Supreme Court, the Democrats better be ready. And they better be ready the day after the election. I've seen elections lost, especially in primary situations where the candidate was not ready to go on the air the next day after the primary. And I think we're in that type of a situation here. This election may not end on election day. You're talking legally mandated recounts in some states. I'm saying that I don't think there's no low bar. There's nothing that the Trump campaign won't do to try to hang on to the presidency. And the Democrats need to be aware of that. And more importantly, they need to be ready for it. Until now and November 3rd, they better learn another message. And that is policy precedes message. Messages that are not rooted in the livelihood improvement of the American people fall flat, no matter how much money you have for television, radio ads. I think that's true. I mean, we've seen over and over and over It's the things that affect people's daily lives that are most important to them. And a lot of those are economic issues. I think there's no doubt about that. That's an alert to whoever is listening to the program in the Democratic Party system. Do you have a website, by the way? Yeah, we're at northwoodsadvertising.com. If you want to see our work, it's easiest to go to YouTube and plug in Northwoods Ads on YouTube. That's Northwoods Ads. Thank you very much, Bill. Finally, Ralph answers your questions with Steve, David, and Matt Marin. Hey, let's do some listener questions. David? This question comes to us from Tariq. Dear Ralph, video games are a huge part of global media culture today, even rivaling Hollywood in revenue and influence, a major playing ground for corporate exploitation and military recruitment as well. Any suggestions or recommendations regarding books that criticize the industry thoroughly Also, I think it would be awesome if you could bring an expert or a guest to discuss this at your show. That's a good point. Actually, the revenues for these games exceed the amount people spend on movies. And the video game industry is over $100 billion now worldwide. I don't have any suggestions offhand, but Matt, if you could find something and get back to them, if there are any that might be useful to them. It's going to make us sound really old, but people watch people playing video games now they just don't play the video yeah that's right yeah they just aoc just did a stream with ilhan omar on twitch which is where people watch video games last night and they had five hundred thousand viewers sort of big success a lot of people talking about it younger people you know teenagers yeah and also Tarek, we'll consider getting an expert to come on a show on this This is a big and growing phenomenon, and it has addictive qualities as well. All right. Our next listener, Kate Paradis, thinks half the Congress should be women. And she writes, Capitol Hill is a bastion of patriarchy. Business can be pressured into hiring women, but women have to be elected to Congress. And with far less wealth than men and a culture that has perpetuated the myth of male leadership, gender inequality is rampant. The Congress itself, even after the dramatic gains of 2018, is still 76% male. My hypothesis is that male-dominated politics is failing our society across the board and that we need to elect as many women to Congress as we possibly can, as quickly as we possibly can. What do you think about that, Ralph? Kate, have you looked at the voting record of the women in Congress? It's not much different than the men. Some are good, some are not good. I mean, look at Senator Blackburn from Tennessee. I mean, she's as bad as any male senator from Alabama. It's not a matter of gender. It's a matter of character, personality, values, principles, experience that brings good people to Congress regardless of their gender or race or ethnic background. I was appalled earlier this year, Steve and David, 
to see that 89 women in the House of Representatives who are Democrats would not challenge the savage sexual predator anymore in the White House. They've given him a pass. And the senators who are Democratic women in the Senate have done the same thing. And the Biden administration, with a woman on the ticket as vice president, done the same thing. So I have not had great hopes that any kind of automatic attribution of superior political performance attributed to gender or race has any credibility in terms of the voting record. Not at all. The Congressional Black Caucus, a lot of them are very corporate-oriented. They take corporate money. They don't have hearings on the horrific injustices in the ghettos and the inner city, even though they were chairs of the committee and the subcommittee. Keep dreaming, Kate. All right. Thank you for that, Kate. David? I think we should take that question out. That's my opinion. You I know, just don't think you're being politically correct. Yeah. It's total uh, nonsense. Somebody's got to call her out to that. Okay. I think just to protect everybody, I think that question should be pulled. Just it doesn't help us. But okay. That's my opinion. That's interesting. Uh, we ought to interview as a guest on that someday, David. Yeah. I, I would just hate for that to be isolated, that question. That's my opinion. Uh, what do you think, Steve? Are you shivering? Uh, uh, no, I, you know, it's funny because Shelly just got a thing from one of our mutual friends about moms for Congress. And it was three women, one a state senator, but one from South Carolina, one from California. And David, I actually wrote to Howie Klein and I said, you know, these people want us to give them money. What do you know about them? And he said, you know, he didn't know the one, but he knew the one from California and said she's a garden variety. Democrat. And the other one in South Carolina probably doesn't have a chance. So he kind of felt the same way is that it's, you know, obviously they're trying, the fact that they're trying to sell this identity of a mom, that a mom is going to be better I no know. matter what. I don't buy it. I, I mean, agree. You know, I, I, Hockman, you know, Kellyanne Conway is a mom. I know. I, I think, anyway, it, it, Ralph The issue is go. not equal opportunity to go to Congress, David, if that's the way you interpret it. Right. No, no, I know what you, I agree with everything you're saying. Yeah. I believe me, I agree with everything you're saying. I hate Obama, but I can't I don't hate him, but I think you can't discount the importance of African American kids seeing an African American in the Oval Office. And when there's something when white men talk about this, there's something well as, First of all, I am not a white man. I'm a person of color. Okay. All right. The other well, thing is we're talking about voting records. We're talking about voting records. We're not talking about inspiration. You inspire people, kids, to want to run for office, and they get into office. you got to judge them by equal standards of whether they're for justice, injustice, corporate crime, facility, or consumer protection, on and on. Right. I've had too much bitter experience with this, David, not to call him out on this. Okay. Even, you know, the worst thing is, never mind reproductive rights. The worst thing is the women Republicans are bad on social safety nets for kids. And you remember Hillary Clinton was the last prominent Democrat to come out for 1010 minimum wage. The last one, we had to have women in children's rights groups call her out on that. The Wall Street Journal says she's having difficulty between her allegiance to Wall Street and her allegiance to single moms. <laughs> See what I mean? Yeah. I agree with you 100%. I, I'm just talking about the aesthetic and whether or not... No, no, you don't agree with me if you raise the aesthetic. It's the right thing to say, period. It doesn't okay. matter who says it. It doesn't okay. matter who says it. This idea is you can't criticize the Democratic women in Congress because they don't They've given this sexual predator a pass for two or three years in the White House because you're a white man. It's stupid. Ridiculous. We need more male feminists in this country. Okay. Right. Anyway, so, you don't have to use all that, uh, Steve, but look, know, can we go to the next yeah. question, which is yes. good. It's yeah. a good yeah. five point. This is from Reed Pierce. Ralph, what do you think of these ideas to fix our democracy? What do you think of these ideas to fix our democracy? One, and the Electoral College. Definitely. Two, term limits. 
Yeah, I'm for two terms for the Senate and six terms for the House, 12 years. After that, they start losing their energy. They either burn out or sell out. You're not worried about lobbyists writing the bills. They already are. I guess it's not an issue. Three, democratize the Senate, U.S. Senate proportionally based, not two per state. Well, that needs some adjustment, but it's, it's a little complex to answer it quickly on the reader's call here. Okay. Four, money out of politics, public funding of campaigns. Completely. Five, create a people's house, a third house of Congress based on a sortition process for a one-time only two-year term akin to jury duty. What does sortition mean? Negative on that. Let's try to create a people's movement first before we have more mechanics. Thank you for that question, Reed. Let's go to our last question here from Mark Erickson. He says, Ralph, I've contacted my senators several times the past month since Ruth Bader Ginsburg passed away, asking them to not participate in a sham process to nominate and confirm a new U.S. Supreme Court justice before the inauguration in January 2021. One of my senators announced that he will not seek re-election for his position as U.S. Senator of my state when the term ends in 2022. It was actually since RBG's death, or possibly just before, that he made the announcement What incentives does this senator have, if any, to follow the will of the people on this or any other issue? It's cause for him to resign. This happened in your fable, how the rats reform the Congress makes sense. But why would he or any other Congress person do what they don't have to do? I'd like to hear your thoughts. Well, you know, if they're not unelected or they're not afraid of being unelected, they can do pretty much whatever they want. You can't impeach a senator. If they violate criminal laws, they can be prosecuted. That has happened and they can be imprisoned. But by and large, on policy matters, as a lot of progressive groups in Washington have found out, it's pretty hard to hold them accountable. Thanks for the question, Mark. And that's a wrap. Join us again next week on the Ralph Nader Radio Hour when we welcome back the head of patriotic millionaires, Morris Pearl. Until next time. Stand up, stand up. You've been sitting raised.